Thanks, Amy. Hi, everyone. I am not going to take up a lot of time, but I asked Amy if I could just hop on real quick to say a big thank you to our panelists today. We are so appreciative of you ladies sharing your wisdom with us today. Every single person on this panel and our fabulous moderator are all exceptionally talented. So I'm really excited to hear the material that they share with us today. And I hope you are too. Thank you to our members as well. Um, and those of you who are joining us, even if you're not members, um, if it's your first time or one of many, I uh, just want to share my appreciation with you and, and that of our chapter. So thanks for your support. Hope everyone is doing well in these interesting times. So back over to you, Amy. Thank you. Thank you, Rebecca. And thank you for your leadership during this time. This is, uh, we are so excited uh, to come together as consultants in our field. Um, you know, first of all, we, we are consultants, but we're here to be a resource for you. Uh, we are, are here for you during this time. So we wanted to you know, provide this opportunity for a conversation. Please note, this is not a sales pitch. This is us coming together as friends, as colleagues, to provide these next and best practices that we've been seeing as we've been talking to clients and prospective clients uh, out in, in the field. So we hope that this will be a great resource for y'all. Um, and we wanted to talk a little bit about what we've been up to during COVID. <laughs> <laughs> what we when the all night things night we've been doing during COVID include we've created and homemade maps with our children. <laughs> Lubell has learned TikTok we'll and it's provided us much joy on social media. <laughs> so, using children like Holly, uh, uh, we're putting them to work and doing <laughs> around the house. Uh, Holly, I believe Love you were for hire. <laughs> yeah, fixing the sink here. And then uh, what I love is uh, Sarah, I believe you have a, have a little door post that you have for all of us working moms. Yes, that was out of much necessity um, and talking about boundaries. So, um, and apparently <laughs> goldfish are still a thing when you're 13 years old, but you just eat it in much larger quantities. <laughs> so... <laughs> So and, it's been interesting. And Lubell, your 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 TikTok fetish we are all like loving. It's bringing much joy. What had <laughs> you started with TikTok? Um, well, after some very long days at work and with just life and the way um, the world is turning, sometimes um, I think the best thing to do is laugh. And so, if anything, I started this to amuse my husband, but I'm glad now that it's um, bringing some um, joy to many of you. So. Um, there it is. <laughs> and do not try the wine glass thing at home. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so much fun. So let's, we'll get to it. Uh, you know, one, one thing that we've, we've heard is I wanted to quickly comment is that um, at least in our firm, we talk about the concept of best and next practices. Uh, what are things that we can look to the past and our experiences as fundraisers to help inform the future? So I uh, just wanted to encourage you all on the call, look at, look at some of those things that you've been through in the past, such as, you know, we all, we all went through Hurricane Harvey. Uh, many of us have been through the recession. So how can you, uh, back in 2008, so how can we look at those experiences to help inform um, ideas here? We certainly don't have a crystal ball, but collectively, we, uh, the four of us come together and put together this presentation. So um, We'll start with our, our first collective question. What national, state, and local fundraising trends are you ladies currently seeing when speaking to nonprofits? I'll uh, toss it to you first, Lubell. Yes, yeah, so um, one of the biggest trends we have found and seen is due to the uncertainty and um, the shelter in place and other aspects of this quarantine is a lot of canceled events, um, a lot of fundraisers that are just not happening right now, and honestly, some um, a very big pivot in how we speak to donors. So we've seen a lot of clients have to refocus um, their budgeting. Um, so whether or not it is reforecasting for the current budget 
um, that you're in right now. Um, and also, a lot of our clients are forecasting for next year's 2021 budget. So they have to really analyze not only um, their expenses, but really try to figure out um, without a crystal ball, like Amy said, what kind of fundraising they can do in the future, whether or not the future is in the next six months or the next 18 months. So a lot of um, conservative estimates, but also trying very, very hard to be positive um, and um, goal oriented. And then the second one, um, the next trend is um, we've seen the temptation of some to um, shift their mission a bit in order to um, kind of uh, go with the times. And we have recommended highly that it is imperative that you stick to your mission. That is why you are here. That is why you do the good that you do in this community and in the city and in the um, country. And so it's very, very important to stick to what you're doing. We understand maybe you have to change paths just a little bit when it comes to your programming um, because of the way things are right now. But stay true to your mission and you'll be golden. Great. Thank you, Lubelle. So we want to avoid mission creep. Okay, Sarah. Uh, it's definitely happening. I agree, Lubelle. There's a lot of that, um, I think, tendency because people are worried that, you know, about their current mission. But what we're always telling people is your mission, it, if it was important before COVID-19, it's still just as important now. Um, it's just a different time. Um, and I know we're probably all very tired of the word pivot. Um, cause we keep saying it, you know, again and again, but that really is the word of the year. Um, because we really just have to keep pivoting. Um, and sometimes that's from 30 days to 60 days, 90 days, just kind of, you know, keeping along that, that line. Um, one thing I've also seen here in the Houston area, um, is kind of that double whammy we're getting from not only the COVID-19, um, economic impact, but then the oil um, and energy sector mm -hmm. um, and the tremendous impact that has had. I don't think we've seen fully what that's going to mean um, for a lot of us. Um, and so I have a lot of uh, clients asking, well, you know, should we even call that that energy partner that we've had for years? Of course, you know, but um, and we'll talk about that a little bit later. But um, I think that there's just a great deal of concern right now here in the Houston community about how that's going to affect us. Um, and of course we don't have crystal balls, but, um, we do know that corporate, you know, giving, you know, did take a little bit of a dip during, you know, other, um, you know, crisis periods. So, you know, I think we need to, that's why looking at individuals is even more important than ever. Um, and then, you know, also with capital campaigns, the other thing that we've seen is the tendency for folks to want to pause or stop capital campaigns. Um, and what I think we're all unified in saying, that, you know, do not stop. Um, because basically that's kind of communicating to your folks that, well, it really wasn't that important and vital anyway. Um, because campaigns mean that it's an extraordinary need for your organization. Um, it does mean that maybe you need to slow down a little bit. So, you know, maybe it slows down, you do a lot more cultivation, you're kind of slowing down, especially depending on what stage you're in. Um, but you definitely don't want to stop your camp capital campaign that gives the wrong message to your donors. So um, that's something that we've been talking through with a lot of clients. Thank you, Sarah. And Holly, do you have uh, more to comment on capital campaigns and other thoughts? Yeah, thank you guys. And and I think the, the group has said it really well. I, I would absolutely agree with the trends that uh, the first two panelists mentioned. And the only thing I might add is uh, what I'm seeing right now and appreciating very much at the same time, uh, especially among both board members and uh, professional fundraising staff, is a real deep sense of commitment to doing it right. Uh, regardless of the tough work that is ahead in terms of reforecasting budgets, uh, really scrubbing what it is about this capital project that uh, will carry us forward for our mission in the future. Um, but that deep, deep commitment to doing it right um, and it's, it's being undergirded by a sense of collaboration um, between CEO, chief development officer, the board, um, the CFO. Uh, I just am, I'm really appreciating this sense of collaboration and this kind of focused determination to get it right for our donors and for um, our clients, those that we serve through our mission. So that would be the only thing I'd add.
Thank you, Holly. I really appreciate that. So on to our next question. What are the best ways to engage internal and external stakeholders right now? So board and leadership. Lou Bell. Yes, um, I think um, one of the best ways that we've um, seen to really um, excite um, and also engage your board is to um, actually do different scenarios for the future. Um, and also make sure that um, with that, that you, um, your staff, that your leadership, uh, administrative leadership can really um, enunciate and story tell um, why your organization is important, not only in general, um, what niche you feel here in Houston, but especially right now during the crisis, um, what are you doing for your constituents? Um, what are you doing for the community? Um, and then also as we ease into whatever this new normal is, um, what is your role going to be then as well? It might be very much the same as it was before um, and your mission continues as we've spoken about, but also really making sure that you're able to share that um, really eloquently with your board board so that they can in turn share that as ambassadors for your organization. And one of those is um, having certain scenarios and having really great questions, um, answers to the questions that might they might have. So um, whether or not it might be an event in the fall, and they say, what are we going to do if and when? It's kind of like, um, you know, making your own story, um, you know, that storytelling where it's like, we'll go left and right and we'll pick this and we'll do that. But being very prepared to know your role, despite what um, might happen. Thank you, Lou Bell. Sarah, your thoughts? Um, yes, I'd fully agree. I mean, I think um, one thing that I've seen from um, a couple organizations is almost a hesitancy to bother their board members because maybe their board members are in industries in the energy sector or in other industries that are um, very overwhelmed right now. And um, actually, that should be the, the total opposite of what you should be doing. So Communication is absolutely essential right now with your boards. Um, they need to know what's going on with your your budgeting. If you're doing forecasting, if you're doing any you know um, realignment or you know whatever it might be, the board needs to know that. And they also need to be in support of what you all are proposing um, and make sure that they are aligned with that um, and supporting you all through this process. Um, I think it's a great time to make sure that they're also. An easy thing to do is just for them to help take care of the staff and give it messages of encouragement to staff members too. Um, but there has to be that that relationship, and this is a, a great time to really push on um, working on those relationship with your board members. You know, just ask for a Zoom call, ask for a coffee call, or a happy hour, depending on the flavor with your board members, and really just try to engage them. And let them know what's going on internally in your organization, because sometimes they can feel, you know, misinformed or uninformed. And that's the last thing you want. Great. Thank you, Sarah. And then, Holly, uh, your thoughts. Yeah, absolutely. The importance of communication right now is can't just can't be overstated. Um, I think it's really important that we think strategically about engaging um, our, our senior executives as well as our board, um, no matter what we have to tell them, uh, with both confidence and transparency. Um, there is a whole lot less that we, we know right now um, than what we, what we don't know. Uh, and that's, that's a reality for most of us. So as that communication keeps going forward, I think balancing a real sense of confidence that the steps and the plans that we've laid out are the right next steps for the organization, um, inviting them to weigh in as appropriate, but making sure we're not going into the nitty gritty details of the sausage making when it comes to how we arrived at some of our plans. Um, I think it's a strong balance between confidence and sharing a very clear picture of what is ahead. And I think uh, in, in, in previous talks, Holly, you mentioned that it doesn't matter your title or rank, that your leadership matters during this time. Do you have some thoughts on that? Yeah, absolutely. I think most of us come from that fundraising seat uh, around the table. Uh, some of us may wear multiple hats. Um, but that, that level of uh, confident and transparent communication 
is it can be can come from all levels. Um, and so I think it's really important that you talk internally uh, with your leadership team about who and and when the right mes- message needs to be put out there, um, who needs to deliver the message, and when the message needs to be delivered. But each of us have a really important role to play in terms of engaging our leadership. And as long as a coordinated um, strategic effort from the inside, I think those are the organizations that I'm seeing really find strength in this moment. We have a great question in the q and I want to encourage all participants that um, there's a middle Q&A um, button. If you want to go ahead and put your questions in there, we will try to answer them during the panel, if not during the Q&A session um, after, after the panel discussion. The question involves a mid-level staffer in a small shop. Um, it seems that they're, um, are, they're trying to encourage donor communication during this time. Um, but, but, and unfortunately it seems like the, the director, um, is taking more of a passive approach instead of an active approach. And they are concerned that the, um, in this passive approach is happening with the board and general constituencies and major donors. So it seems that, um, they're concerned about meeting goal and it, it seems like this is about a, a managing up question. How do you encourage, what are some great ways that we can encourage our leaders, whether our leader is the executive leader, our direct report, or a development director, or a director of, say, individual giving, depending on, you know, no matter where your rank is, how can we encourage these courageous conversations to happen? Because it does take courage to um, really uh, request that your boss become more proactive. Um, So what what are some ways that we could um, and encourage this attendee. Um, so I think, first of all, thank you for your excellent question. Um, I think one of the things you could, um, t- you know, maybe share with um, your direct report is how hard you and your team have worked to get to know your donor so well. So she is actually right in some ways that there are some folks that you just want to check in on right now. And you know them and you know that possibly they're in the oil sector or possibly um, they're fighting with... um, taking care of somebody that's ill right now, whatever that might be. But there are donors out there that are ready to give. And I think you really, um, that's what you've spent your time doing is to get to know your donors and know which ones right now um, are ready for the ask. And you could also really um, say that you attended a webinar with four different consultants <laughs> from, uh, that range from local to national fundraising um, uh, firms and that the recommendation is truly to be courageous during this time. Um, we communicate clear and internal, um, duties to the board. You know, the board can do things internally, like help with staff morale. Uh, they could also come together and do a challenge match. So those, um, there's some practical and tactical tips that, uh, we will leave our emails at the end of this session that you're welcome to reach out and, and we can afford some of those tips directly to you. Sarah, were you sorry, that? sorry about that, Amy. Um, I wanted to mention like a direct um, tactic for this scenario um, when you are, you know, have a director of development who's new, who's a little cautious. I agree with Lou Bell that, you know, there's going to, you know, I would make your list. I would help help your director of development out of making your list of those donors that you feel like are close and really, really warm and ready, you know, because maybe they were cultivated to, up to the point before all this happened that they were ready for an ask. Um, maybe, you know, a list of the ones that need a little more cultivation, maybe a check-in call. And then, you know, kind of divide it up and maybe more bite-sized pieces for her. So it's not just this, hey, we need to do asks or, hey, we need to get some money in. Um, maybe divide it up, get a little more specific and kind of walk through where you are with each donor. Um, and then one of the things that I've been, you know, um, challenging some of people who are afraid to talk about the money and asks during this time, um, when you're having a... This is not a cold call. So this is somebody, you know, but if you're talking to somebody, you know, one of your donors and you say, how are you doing? You know, how has all of this affected your, you know, how has this COVID-19 affected your philanthropic vision or your philanthropic look Mm -hmm. on things? Um, That's a great question to kind of get them talking about giving and where they are. Um, And so um, again, it depends on the stage of the relationship. So she's new she could also play the new card, but if she's not comfortable with that, you may have to give her, 
you know, some little baby steps there, you know, on that front, maybe give her the check-in calls first and then, you know, see if um, she's comfortable with allowing other people to make, you know, some of the warmer apps. I love that. Questions, we can get into detail later. I love that idea, Sarah. And it really leads into the best, uh, as a best lead in for our next question, because it's a, this focus of stewardship. If you have a really great win of cultivating or stewarding a donor, that's going to build the confidence of your director or your ED to make more of those phone calls if they are not comfortable with the solicitation. Can we be fundraising with individuals during and after this challenging time? Pass it to you, Lubell. Sure. Um, so many of you, if not all of you, know that there has been an unprecedented outpouring of support um, from various folks um, nationally and globally um, because of this um, to give to nonprofits. And I'm sure you've seen um, many of the here are 700 foundations or 700 um, national philanthropists that um, are giving right now, but I would just highly recommend that you stay close to home. Um, even though I've been asked twice already who the CEO of Zoom is and whether or not I have his email address. It's Eric Juan. I don't have his email address. Maybe he'll watch one of my TikToks one day, but um, he, um, I would just say very much stay Stay close to home, stay close to who your current donors are. And those are the folks that will be supporting you the most and the truest during this time. Um, I would also highly encourage you to possibly go back a little bit to the individuals that um, maybe you haven't heard from in um, a little while. Um, and just to ask them, A, how are they doing? Um, that you that whether or not um, they need anything from y'all. Um, but I think that leads into my second point, which is contact all your donors. Owners right now. Um, I'm sure I'm preaching to the best choir in the world they've already done that, but we have very much um, encouraged our clients to um, choose um, to pretty much email or call all their major donors just to check in, um, whether or not it's the development director or whether or not, like Sarah said, they divided it up among the team. Um, I think there is such a sense of comfort and hope um, when they hear from y'all um, because A, it shows that you're still there, that you're still um, not only doing your mission, but that you care about the donor in a way that you're checking in. So I know that um, the Q and I said that you're already doing that, and that's wonderful. Um, but I would definitely, instead of looking too far outside of your family, I would definitely keep it um, close um, and make sure that your current donors um, are communicated with, and then they should that should lead to an ask as well. Awesome, thank you, Lou Bell. Sarah, I would again. I mean totally with Lou Bell. It's all about relationships. So, um, and you know, our firm, we're super big on relationship based fundraising. So this is our bread and butter. Um, you are primarily right now is the time to be working really, really, really hard on those relationships that you already have. Um, so, you know, I, I, I know somebody's asking about acquisition and we can maybe get to that in a minute, but I would say that now is not the time to be launching a major acquisition project. However, it depends on who you are. So that's kind of a caveat. Um, but just don't stop fundraising um, is the big thing. So you got to pivot. You have to be sensitive um, and, you know, don't be afraid to address the elephant in the room of COVID-19. But again, the people who've been supporting you still love you. It's not that they stopped loving you. So, you know, just, again, reach out to them and really work on those relationships. Talk about what you're doing. Um, and I have heard again and again and again from our clients and from others that people are actually answering their phones for once, mm -hmm. for once, you know, which is amazing because it's been so hard to get people on the phone in the past. So please pick up the phone and call and you'll be amazed at how many people actually answer. So, um, and having those, Phone chats or Zoom chats, if you go to Zoom, have been very, very um, helpful for a lot of clients at building those relationships. Because um, if you ask, how are you doing? Then a lot of times they'll say, well, how are you guys doing? What do you need? You know, that kind of thing. So again, it's just conversation and relationships. It doesn't have to be scary. Thanks, Sarah. Holly? Yeah, no, I am on board with all of these. And honestly, the way I boil it down when I think about individual fundraising from here on out um, is, is three words that are kind of focusing me in coaching my clients. Um, it's compassion, it's fundraising with personalization, and it's persistence. 
right? And it, I think it speaks to all the things that, that the team has said here, but compassion really is taking the time to make personal calls. Um, and it's not just to your longest, or excuse me, your largest donors, but it's to your most loyal, longstanding donor relationships, right? Even if it's a $10 a month donor, but somebody who's been doing that consistently for years, that kind of compassion to reach out where the first question is, talk to me about how this is affecting you and your life. That has been tremendously well received. And I think we're going to need more and more of that moving forward. Personalization, again, going back to some of the comments that have been made, um, there is a messaging, there's, a, there's a, a moment for messaging and a moment for mass communications right now. But the more we can spend the time to do the personalized outreach, uh, the bigger payoff we're getting in terms of donor relationships and donor um, commitment to, to who we are and what we do in our mission. Um, and then finally, that persistence. Um, as we think about individual giving um, and we think about one of those tools that's so important for us as fundraisers in terms of um, multi-year pledges, uh, we don't know what those multi-year pledges might look like from individuals coming up this year, next year, as we look for the, uh, those operating commitments or the capital commitment. So we need to be persistent and prepared to ask, um, perhaps even more uh, than we would regularly if if multi-year commitments give people a little bit of a hesitation for a short period of time here. So those would be my three focal points um, around individuals, compassion, personalization, and persistence. Thank you, Holly. That's great. And um, the theme that I'm really encouraging uh, my arts and culture clients is uh, this idea of courageous creativity. So as we can um, come together, I know we've talked about courage. It takes courage right now for us to get in front of donors, but um, enlist other staff. You have other staff members that are excited to help. And so they're, and, and this goes a little bit to the acquisition question, um, engage your other staff in the discovery, cultivation, and solicitation and stewardship calls. Um, you know, they don't have to be fundraisers, particularly in the discovery, cultivation, and stewardship aspect. Get other people involved to help you with these calls because um, the more that you are connecting, uh, it could be your program staff or your teaching artists or um, you know other other folks. Getting people in touch with the mission, if they have someone directly who does pro programs, calling them on the phone for a discovery call or a cultivation or a stewardship call, and those that's huge wins for the institution and it's getting them closer in touch. So be creative. Um, we have to fundraise differently right now. Um, so don't don't be scared to be creative during this time. Um, and so it, it's, it really calls upon all of us to do that. Um, so there are some creative ways of prospecting that you can do as well. Uh, it takes some research. But again, you'll have our emails at the end of this. And, and um, we, we can talk more about that maybe during the Q&A. Amy, I, I wanted to bring up one example of what you're talking about. Um, and one of my clients um, is a private school, um, not here in the area, but they um, they decided that they were going to call every single family in the school, um, which I'm so happy they took our advice on that. Um, and, uh, you know, instead of putting it all on the development, they have a very small development office and the head of school. Um, obviously, they gave certain, you know, certain strategic people to certain um, but they had the school nurse and a couple other people who they engaged because the school nurse is not doing anything right now. And so the school nurse was like, I'm happy to call people and they have a great community and she was a great person to call. And so, I mean, again, just get creative. I mean, who would have thought the school nurse becomes part of the development team? But, you know, it also helps, you know, your culture of philanthropy. So, you know, getting your staff, you know, beyond just development to understand what development is really about. And it actually could be quite fun and not scary. So, um, you know, I think that's been really great for them. I'd also like to call out um, our wonderful friends from the Alley Theater that are on this call. They have been really great at engaging there are other uh, staff members. The reason I know is uh, uh, one of my friends is in the artistic team and she's been making calls and has been really enjoying that process. So, um, you know, people are doing it. People are making asks, they're making calls and stewarding. This is a, 
donor relations renaissance that we're going through. So really harness this time. Um, yeah, I can't, can't emphasize that enough. Okay, so based on the climate, um, how would you approach corporate and foundation funders right now? Um, well, here's the thing, and y'all know this, is um, it's very, the first step is very similar to individual fund, um, fundraising because um, in foundations and corporations, y'all have made the relationship with one person there, whether or not it's the grants officer or possibly a board member of a foundation or even the community relations director or manager at a corporation. That is, um, we keep stressing it, the relationship building. Um, so we would absolutely connect with them to just um, see what they're doing, whether or not they have changed the process of their giving and their applications. Um, we have found that there are many folks that are staying the course. They have a calendar, they are following the calendar, and they're just keep they're just keeping on going on um, like they um, regularly have. And some actually, I think, are taking some time to look at their own portfolios to see how much they've been able to give um, later in the year or currently now. So it's very much just like individual fundraising make that um, continue that stewardship of your connection there and um, see how they were doing and also how they are um, evolving um, with everything going on. And I had this question the other day from, um, you know, a former client. And I would say if you have a relationship with them um, and have received funding from them before, because they were kind of asking, well, we had, you know, gotten to a point where they're about to do a and then all this happened. It's like, well, of course, reach out and call them and say, how are you? How are you doing? Because remember, relationships go both ways. You know, they're experiencing their own personal and professional hardships as well. So don't be, a, you know, think of a foundation. As they, I think sometimes people think of this foundation as this murky, mysterious thing. And it's like, it's people. People are behind that. So call them and say, how are you? Are you hanging in? Um, and, you know, if you were at the point where it was almost time to submit a grant or I think there's nothing wrong with saying, what should we do? We want to be sensitive to this time. You know, have you changed your plans? What should we do? They will talk. I mean, I can't imagine that somebody wouldn't be, um, you know, okay with answering that question. Um, you know, just be sensitive. You know, the other thing is I wouldn't start calling up every foundation in town and saying, hey, are you given? Hey, are you given? If you've never, you know, talked to them before, because um, that's probably a little insensitive. So, you know, I think you have to kind of, again, focus on the relationships that you've been working on and have. Awesome. Thank you, Sarah. Holly, your thoughts? Yeah, no, good input all the way around. Um, I, I'm going to... Um, an echo, I think, what the team said about uh, many of these funders, at least for this year, uh, have plans set. And if you've been in that conversation line for um, for a gift or for consideration of a gift, by all means, consider that a planned solicitation or a qualified prospect that the conversation should go on and, and really you need to forge ahead with that right ask. Um, with the right steps of communication. Uh, the thing to me that I do think is really important for our for those of us who um, who find ourselves working both at uh, the board level as well as our responsibility on the direct fundraising side is I think it's going to be more important than ever that we spend the right time identifying and cultivating more relationships within those foundations and corporations during this time um, for the prospects that aren't necessarily at that qualified stage for us right now. They're suspects, perhaps, or maybe they're uh, one layer of qualified, but not, uh, not to the point where we know we're going to make an ask in 2020. I think we've got to get really, really serious about building right relationships um, to set ourselves up for consideration in the future. Um, and that's, that also kind of brings me back to some of the themes that I've heard the repeated here today, but um, just that, that sense of courage over comfort. Um, Got to go with my friend Renee Brown, uh, Brene Brown, excuse me. Um, it takes courage to really strategize how are we going to build a relationship and how are we going to put ourselves out there uh, when the answer might be no. Um, but we got to do it if we're going to remain relevant both this year and next year and into the future. So it's exciting times. It's scary, but it's exciting. Those are excellent points, ladies. Um, and I want to move to our final question before we open it up for the Q&A. 
Um, what are the biggest questions you are getting from clients right now during COVID? Me? Yeah. Yeah, go ahead, Lovell. <laughs> Everyone can chime in. Yeah. Um, I think um, one of um, the biggest questions, and this is the hardest, is um, how do you make the difficult decision on how where to cut your expenses if your revenue isn't coming in? And, mm -hmm. um, and that is um, something that I think is the most challenging because it also um, might require some staff decisions as well. So I think um, the biggest thing that we um, actually try to share is what is um, what is the best program, what are the things that are going to move your mission forward um, in the most efficient and most important way? And so whether or not there are programs that you love um, that might not be able to be um, funded for next budget um, and, and whether or not it is they um, don't have enough, en enough participants or whether or not the um, expense is too great, I think um, the main thing is to really um, take some time to look at the different programs you do and see okay, which ones are the ones that only we can do? In all of the city and the community, if this was lost, there would be a giant hole um, with our um, constituents. And then um, you would backtrack from there. So I think that's one of the biggest ones is, okay, if we're not bringing um, the revenue and the fundraising and the development isn't coming in as we would hope, how do we cut the expenses to balance that? And I think it's um, staying, again, staying true to what you do and, ex and what do you do that no one else does um, and trying to make sure that you continue to fill that void. Sarah? I love that, Lubell. And because we talk about the story all the time and a story isn't a good story without conflict. And so what's the conflict here? You know, like as far as if it didn't happen, you know, if we didn't exist or if we couldn't do program X, then what would happen? Um, and I think that that's a really good exercise to go through with your staff and with your board to remind them that your mission is still important. Um, and yes, these are unprecedented times. Um, I firmly believe that philanthropy is going to, you know, rise up and meet this. Mm -hmm. um, what I've been telling a lot of clients, I feel like it's been, it's getting a little bit better, but it's been kind of like a big flurry, like a snowstorm, you know? Um, and so it's like, everybody is just taking care of their own. They're trying to figure out, okay, do I have a job? Do I not? And then you know, when that when that fuzz finally clears, you're going to start seeing those gifts come in, um, especially from those that you've been in communication with. So this is the time to communicate, communicate, communicate. Um, and if you're not seeing a lot of big gifts yet, I would not panic. It, I think it's coming. It's coming down the road. Um, I have seen some gifts from through certain organizations, but and a lot of those were teed up before this, and they were considering it before this, and then they, you know, made the gift. But um, some are also reaching out and saying, "I want to help right now because I know you may need it." Schools are looking at tuition assistance funds, so you know, there's just all sorts of stuff. But you know, basically, it's the um, I would just also say like the crystal ball question we get all the time, and I wish that we were you know, we knew what was going to be coming down the road. Um, but I get a lot of the crystal ball sort of questions like, you know, what should we do? What's it going to look like in six months? Um, and so our question has been project 30 days at a time, 60 days at a time, 90 days at a time max, just like, you know, because chances mm -hmm. are it might change. So you're going to have to be nimble and you might have to just throw your development plan plan out the window and start over and, you know, and do 30, 60, 90 days and then keep changing it. <laughs> so that's, a, you know, that's, we're just telling people it's, you've got to throw the normal out the window and be nimble. Holly. Yeah, absolutely. I have to, I got to piggyback on that though, Sarah, because it reminds me of a quote I saw a colleague found the other day um, from a, a New York investor, just sort of reflecting on, on, what do we have in front of us? And his quote was, these days, everyone has the same data regarding the present and the same ignorance regarding the future. I mean, that's, it's, a, it's an equalizer, at least on the knowledge level. We're all kind of like, what, what, what's this? We don't know. Um, but I think that is very, very real. Um, and I, I wish I had the crystal ball to give all the answers. Um, but one of the questions that, that I've been hearing within our organization is, is or excuse me, within um, organizations that we serve uh, is really how should we be kind of messaging ourselves and how do we make that right communication if we we have a bit of a self-consciousness that we're not quote-unquote essential services right we're not 
feeding people, clothing people. Um, and I, I've, I've answered that a number of different ways. I think looking at uh, what we know about crisis giving, that there is a real desire to stabilize during kind of the, the resurgence of, uh, or during the surge of a crisis. Um, and so I think many of us, many of our missions do have a role to play in stabilization. So asking that question of the nonprofits, what what is your role in stabilizing this crisis right now? Because I think that's an important thing to draw attention to um, as as we feel all all the things around us right now. Um, but that's it, it, it's not always the easiest question to answer, but it's really pushing some organizations to reflect very thoughtfully um, on the value of the mission. Uh, in different um, circumstances and through different lenses right now. So asking that question of yourself, what's our role in stabilization? And then what's our role on the flip side of that, of this, which is restoration and innovation? How are we bringing to the table um, something new, something valuable on the restoration and innovation side? Um, so it's a, it's a good time to wrestle through those questions. We've also gotten um, a lot of questions about um, what, if we're planning an event for the fall, should we still keep on track with that plan? Um, and then, you know, one webinar that I recently gave, uh, we talked about three different options. And so I think as you're planning, you almost have to have planned from a, a different case scenario. Um, so you should look at all the various options you have. Uh, if you did, if you were to plan and do something um, in person, what would that look like? Um, if you wanted to do a virtual event, what would let that look like? And then, if you wanted to do maybe a digital event, what would that look like? Um, and so, uh, those are all different uh, that you should consider. So, uh, we have a. Uh, you could also try some digital options as well. Um, a digital, uh, you could do a giving day. And so we have a really great question uh, from um, uh, Diane on the chat that uh, talks about a big push for Giving Tuesday. I feel like our market's a little different given the price of oil in the rest of the country. So question is if doing a big Giving Tuesday push is right right now. Um, I want to give that, toss that out to the group. And then also, um, we're in our uh, Q&A session right now. And so if you want to go ahead and put your Q&As in the Q&A box, we will get to them right now. Thank you. Yeah, I'll, I'll chime in just on the, the Giving Tuesday. There's a reason Giving Tuesday was kind of pushed up to May. So I, I would say, um, yes, we are in a different situation, but a lot of times Giving Tuesday is a wise strategy to really engage and, and open our arms wide to um, individual donors uh, who might be compelled to support something um, as big as our whole mission and vision, but as small as the thing we need to do right now to serve our clients is, um, you know, raise $500 in order to buy next week's groceries or whatever that looks like. So I would say, yes, you should be involved in that game. And I, I would bet if you hadn't really been involved in e-philanthropy or digital fundraising before, you are now. Um, and I would say, absolutely, this is a game to be in. And there's a way to do it that doesn't look opportunistic or um, negative. We just have to remain confident. Our mission does indeed warrant philanthropic support and be super duper confident in the ask from that, that grounded position, I guess I would say. Um, I, would, I would use Giving Tuesday as a way to update your donors as well. Um, I think at the very beginning of this, there was a plethora of emails um, um, to either let people know that you were still open or that um, asking for funding um, because it was um, before that small business loans went out. But um, I think Giving Tuesday might be a way to show what you've been doing during the past six, seven weeks, whatever your start date um, was, um, what, what online classes you've been doing, whether or not you're um, showcase your current beneficiaries and how you're helping them right now in a different way. And then, um, you know, provide the link to give because it's Giving Tuesday. So if you're able to use it as a um, twofold effort to let your donors know we're still here, we're still active, we're still thriving. Um, and please give us 
some money, um, I think would be um, an excellent way to make sure that it's, um, it's, it's an email, it's a push that is informative as well. And I would say, um, you know, I think also you may not want to wait for just Giving Tuesday. Um, I know that some folks are having Giving Days. I think University of St. Thomas just had a great one yesterday, and that was super successful. So go UST team. Um, but, you know, I think that you look at your own organization and what works best. Um, I'll just be honest. I am not a Giving Tuesday fan. Um, <laughs> I'm just not. Um, but I do think that you should be a part of something like that. But if you're putting all your eggs in the Giving Tuesday basket, that is not where they should be. So um, yes, Giving Tuesday is a great way to communicate your mission, get it out there, be fun and creative with some online content. Um, but again, it goes back to the relationship-based fundraising. So I'm just going to push you guys back to, you know, yes, make a great Giving Tuesday plan, but that should be one piece of a much bigger puzzle, you know, going on with your your organization. So don't put it all on, you know, we're going to make our goal on Giving Tuesday. That, you know, that's not where you want to go. Yeah, I agree. Look at Giving Tuesday as a channel instead of a be, you know, an, an end all, be all. Um, because uh, for Giving Tuesday, it's it's a great option uh, to reinforce your current solicitations. Um, so it's a way to really collaborate with marketing and uh, communications teams uh, on on being able to reinforce what you're already doing. Um, I was just giving advice to a client of you know how can you use it as a re really reinforcement of a current appeal that's going out. But by, I mean, if you haven't heard anything, if you don't hear anything from this, you know, the main takeaway is that one-on-one -on -one personalized solicitation and stewardship and all the groundwork that you do right now during this time is going to reap benefits when we get out of it. So this is the time to invest in infrastructure. This is the time to invest in your donors, in donor care. Again, after, after the next couple of weeks, it's going to be a lot harder for us to get in touch with our donors. So use this time now to get in front of them and tell them how much you care and how important and essential they are to your institution. Um, any other, any other Q&A questions? If you'll go ahead and just put them in the chat. Um, and um, as we close up, ladies, any, any final thoughts that you want to to offer, we can talk about, um, I know we had a previous question about um, acquisition and prospecting. Um, any thoughts on acquisition that we can discuss during the Q&A? Um, I already weighed in, so I'm, I'm not big on the acquisition um, tactic right now. Um, I'm just curious if um, Holly or Lubell, if you've had anybody doing any acquisition efforts. No, I actually completely agree with Sarah. Um, I think that right now it is the sustainability of your organization that is um, paramount, um, especially during this time, not only in this, um, what, you know, I think it's fascinating how um, in the middle of March, um, it was how do we get to May 1st? Um, and now it might be, how do we get to the end of 2020 um, safe and sound? And we believe that we can, and we believe that y'all can, we believe in all of you. But right now, I think the focus should be um, just making sure that you're operating an annual um, budget is met. And if all of y'all are doing the capital, if, if some of you are doing capital campaigns, that should be your second priority is um, continuing to um do the asks and doing the cultivation for um, whatever your capital campaign project is. So yeah, I'm, I'm all about um, just making sure that right now we stick to um, the main um, important parts of your organization. Holly, we got a question. If, is, if someone could speak about how to adjust a capital campaign uh, and the planning of it during this time, especially if you're already in the silent phase, would you mind answering that for us? Oh yeah, absolutely. Great question. I think it, in all honesty, my my two cents is if you're in the planning phase right now, this is a really advantageous kind of moment for you um, because it goes back to to that commitment. I feel like I'm seeing from from nonprofits that there's a real commitment to getting this right. You have sort of this unprecedented um, moment right now to invest the right time in strategy making for your capital campaign. And I would tell organizations right now, I think it's very important to still talk about the vision 
that you have that's associated with the campaign, right? Because there's two sides of this coin. There's the vision and then there's the campaign. The vision, assuming that vision is real and is important and is supported by leadership, it shouldn't go anywhere, right? It should be part of a big picture strategic plan. Um, So keep talking about that vision, but really, really work on refining the need, the budgets, the priorities for that campaign right now and spend a little bit of extra time talking to some of those prospective lead gift donors um, where you know uh, you built that scale of gifts and they are essential to reaching success because they're at the top of that that scale. I think it's more important than ever to really understand um, uh, understand they're, they're with us the whole way moving forward in this initiative. I think with the, the silent phase, you know, if you've already started solicitation, major solicitations with your top 10, top 20, you know, sort of donors, um, you know, I would not go silent on them, uh, silent in the silent, you know, as far as not talking about it. Um, so, you know, don't, you know, freeze and not say anything about your capital campaign. Again, your capital campaign is addressing an extraordinary need that's just as important as it ever was. So, you know, going to those donors and you may have to add some more steps in your process um, in your silent phase with each donor, depending on where they are comfort level wise, if they're in the energy sector, if they need a little more time, but, you know, continue to work through those, those asks and, um, your preparation towards those asks, which, you know, is, you know, takes a lot more time. The ask is the little bit, you know, that's the preparation towards that is, you know, takes a lot of planning and coordination. So I would say, don't stop, um, just be sensitive and smart and creative in how you are cultivating those folks during this time. Um, and you're going to find some are okay with talking about it and making, you know, making a gift um, or a pledge. Some may need a little bit more time and you may need to just continue to cultivate them and talk about the, you know, absolute need, you know, of this campaign and that they're going to be essential to the success of this. Um, but, you know, um, I think you're going to have to evaluate just like you do with everybody relationship by relationship. Each person is going to be different. Okay, ladies, for um, a final question, uh, I wanted to throw out, uh, so pull out your crystal balls. What is going to change in our sector, city, area, or, or services that we provide as a result of this time? So give your predictions of what you think is going to change. How is our sector going to change? Maybe how is working as a development professional, how is that going to change as a result of this? Um, I can go ahead and start out. I definitely think um, that there's going to be some reevaluation of remote work. Um, I personally am a full-time now remote worker. Um, I was before this time. So, uh, but I, I can actually foresee maybe some other um, nonprofits in, in our space deciding that this is a more cost-effective way and, and that you don't lose any efficiencies from, you know, being able to work, work remotely. So there's my prediction. Okay. Very good. Yeah, yeah. Um, Bell, I, go ahead. I, I hope that is not the case because if y'all if y'all can't tell right now, I am not good at this um, screen thing. I can't see myself, so forgive me if like you're if I'm to the left or tootsie rolling to the right for y'all. But um, <laughs> but I am. Um, I think one of the um, biggest changes that we will have is um, everyone's need to be incredibly nimble and flexible. That isn't um, anything new. I think all of us um, in our um, profession continue to, um, or have always been able to um, take a different path or um, change um, in the middle of a meeting or an event, Um, especially all those um, event planners out there. I know y'all are just incredible when it comes to shifting at the last minute. But I think now more than ever, it's going to be, um, and and this is where you really need to stress this to your board, um, when a budget is set or when a um, program um, is um, has a certain number of people participating or a certain number of um, staff members working on it, or if an event is scheduled, um, there needs to be a very big push to your leadership and staff on the need to be flexible, nimble, and understanding. So um, as much as um, that is very vague, I think that is going to be our biggest um, need for the next, I'd say, 
maybe year, 18 months, um, is to continue to have those, um, all of us have spoken about it, the different scenarios are going to be very, very critical um, in the near future. Yeah, and, and I would just, oh, sorry, go ahead, Amy. No, go ahead, Holly. Um, I was just going to say, I think building off of the, the nimbleness um, is hopefully, I, I, this is kind of both a prediction and a hope, but that there is an increased willingness to try different things um, because I don't think we can all rely on that the same old, same old is going to see us into the future, right? Um, so a willingness to try new things and make smart uh, investments with our resources when it comes to fundraising, but but have a plan behind it, I guess I would say. Um, not be stuck in, this is how we've already done it, always done it, so let's keep doing it that way. Um, just a real openness to think differently about how we've done our fundraising operations, our donor engagement, our uh, leadership engagement, um, because these kinds of scenarios force creativity and a lot of times growth comes out of these force moments, um, of, of creative, um, creative explosion. Yes. I love it, Holly. Um, I have two things. I'm going to, I'm going to say one, um, this is almost probably more a prayer and a hope on my part that, um, that we begin to rely less on event fundraising. Mm. Um, so, uh, <laughs> yes, right. I get an amen, um, get an amen. Um, I'm not saying get rid of all of your events. However, I think that being smarter, um, about, you know, your events and, um, not relying on your events so much for your revenue, um, and maybe consolidating to just one event a year rather than three, um, that kind of thing. And I have seen, I've heard one client of ours finally said, I am so, you know, not that they're glad that this pandemic happened, but they're like, oh my gosh, this was what we were looking for as a reason to give up this event. Because everybody had just been doing it, like Holly said, like again and again and again each year, even though it wasn't really a good ROI for the organization. So they've tossed it and they're never going back to it again. And so I think that's a positive, And I think that's something um, you'll see, um, you know, come out of this. Um, I am prayerful that we really focus on the basics of philanthropy of relationships, relationships, relationships. So again, if you didn't get my, my word, it's relationships. So, but two, I would say uh, uh, real quick, Sarah, we're at the hour. Oh, so okay. I did. I did want um, Rebecca to just, before we leave, go, go, uh, go ahead and give us here are all of our emails to reach out personally. Um, but, but, uh, Rebecca, if you wanted to, to plug the next panel before everyone, uh, hops off the call and then we can stay on for a little bit. Sure. I do hope that Sarah gets to finish her comment. Sarah, I think <laughs> angels sang when you said that about events. <laughs> <laughs> um, thank you again to all of the panelists and thank you to all of you who joined us today. Um, yeah, as, so everyone's got their um, email addresses up on the screen, and I know that they would be open to further questions, so don't hesitate to reach out to our panelists. Um, but also, we have recorded this session, and we'll be um, sending it out probably, if not by Friday, then Monday. Um, so stay tuned for that. There's also going to be a survey sent out in the next couple of days. So we'd love to hear from you all um, what you thought of the program and um, if there are any other topics that we can bring you all. Please keep checking the afphouston.org website for our events. Um, we have more of these coming up. Um, in this hometown talk series, our next one is uh, next week on May 8th, and the topic is planned giving amidst a pandemic. Um, pretty obvious topic, but a very timely one, I think. Um, before that, actually tomorrow, there is for our members only a virtual affinity group. Um, so if you're a member of a small development shop, look into registering for that and joining the group tomorrow afternoon. That should be a good discussion. Um, and then if you are plowing ahead with studying for your CFRE certification on May 14th, um, we've been offering these quarterly CFRE study sessions and we are doing that um, 
even in spite of things, we're going to do it virtually. So feel free to sign up for that. Um, one thing I need to note about the next hometown talk, it is free for members of AFP. Um, for non-members, it is $10. Um, but if you register for the hometown talk next week for that $10, then um, it qualifies you to attend webinars for the rest of the month for free. So um, definitely a value there. And then finally, other content on our website, we still have our COVID-19 tools and resources up, check those out. Um, we've had members um, writing blog articles for us. So um, take a look at those, they're reflecting on things going on right now. The most recent one was just about self-care, which I think is something um, that we often look over or neglect for ourselves, but it's so important. Um, and then we also have a recap of last week's hometown talk, and we'll be putting our recap of, of this week's up soon as well. So that's all I've got, but thank you again, everyone, and I'll, I'll leave you to it. Thank you, Rebecca. Sarah, if you just want, did, did anyone want to make some final thoughts while we close up? I know we're uh, three after the hour, but yeah, if anyone has any final thoughts they'd like to share. I'll be quick on my point too, but I was going to say that it's a little more forward thinking, but um, crises tend to accelerate trends. And so what um, I think, you know, and I think we'll all agree that Houston is probably overwhelmed with too many nonprofits. Um, some, you know, kind of in the same space. Um, and so this may actually um, create a need for more collaboration um, or emerging, um, which I know sounds scary to you guys, um, but I would really encourage you to think about it because um, there could be some really amazing creative ways that you guys could come together as organizations and maybe not even a full merger, but maybe there are partnerships or something where you can be more powerful together um, because I think it's just the natural, natural thing of, you know, the way this is going, there are just so many dollars and so many organizations. So some of you who are very, very small, it doesn't mean that you're not important. It might mean that you can collaborate with others um, and then kind of, you know, help each other out on that front. So I would, again, encourage the creativity and trying new things. And that's a great way to end, Sarah, is that, you know, we all came together collaboratively to provide this resource for you. So we encourage that cross collaboration together. Um, Thank y'all so much for being here. Uh, Holly, Lubell, anything else before we head out? No, Amy, thank you so much for um, facilitating. You were stellar. And um, thanks to all of you for taking the time. And I think the main thing is just stay in touch with your donors and don't forget um, just to tell your story um, as much as you can. Um, because I think um, possibly in during this time, your story might have changed a little bit, but it is um, still incredibly important to your beneficiaries, your donors, and to the community. Awesome. Thank yeah. you. And thank you. Keep at it, friends. Keep at it, friends. That's my last two cents. Keep at it. Hang in there. Leverage each other's wisdom. And we're onward and upward together. We'll get there. We got this. Thanks for being here. We're cheering you guys on. Thanks. Thanks so much. Afternoon. Bye, everyone. Thank you, Bye.